And away we go. It's another edition of the Arrowhead Pride Editor Show. My name is Pete Sweeney. I'm the editor-in-chief of ArrowheadPride.com. Joined once again by my executive editor, John Dixon. John, the Chiefs are back in the win column, and they avoid what would have been the first three-game losing streak in the history of Patrick Mahomes. I think I think that's a win in its own right. That's a pretty incredible accolade to have that, that we probably don't talk about enough. Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, even before Patrick arrived, the Chiefs would sometimes win three or, or lose three or four in a row. Uh, I specifically think of the, I think it was the 2015 se- season when they were one and six, and then won the rest of the way through the playoffs. I think it was. Um, so yeah, the, it did happen once in a while, even under Andy Reid's uh, care. But since Mahomes has been around, not at all. Kind of an amazing statistic, frankly. Yeah, the Chiefs win 27 to 17 against the Patriots. I, I thought the feel of this game, John, was one of for a second there, you're like, is this going to be one of those days where they have a close call against New England? And then shortly after that, where you were a little bit panicked, it the game settled down and, and the Chiefs showed to me that, you know, they're the superior team and avoided what was like an early scare against New England. No, I agree. Um, it, it didn't look too good until the early in the third quarter. That interception made all the difference in the world and how you felt about the game while it was going on. But that's what, you know, a 14-point lead will do for you. <laughs> yeah, right. I've, I found that to be a consistent pattern while watching football games. You feel better when there's a 14-point lead. <laughs> on this show, we will go over Andy Reid. He had his usual Monday morning zoom we'll have our world famous marinated takeaways we'll take a deeper look at the snap counts and we'll get the opening odds for christmas day against the las vegas raiders the chiefs will play a a noon game on a monday which will be an odd phenomenon if you like the arrowhead pride editor show and the arrowhead pride podcast network you can leave us a rating and a review and as usual we'll read it on the editor show show. so before we get into andy reed's press conference we had two new reviews this week the first is from phantom mark uh, cut the wide receiver dead weight he says five stars what a waste of what should have been a gallant touchdown for the ages in victory it's time to cast tony mvs and sky more overboard uh that's what their individual and collective plays have attempted to do the chief season in spirit go chiefs uh and uh you know this had to come after the last game it looked like this review came in after the last game and before this one but uh, another complaint about Tony uh, Tibby had in this one, and, and I'm, we're going to get into that in just a second. Our second review came from DM2005. The editor shows my favorite podcast when it comes to football news. Pete Sweeney and his esteemed editor, John Dixon, are simply the best in the business. It was great to see Mahomes fired up after the game uh, and simply wonderful to hear the normally soft-spoken Andy Reid so mad that he told the reporters he couldn't believe the questions asked. Uh, my question to you is both. <laughs> <laughs> Will we see a typical Veach overcorrection in regard to the wide receiver position this offseason? Will he both sign and draft the top wide receiver and never again let Mahomes play without two excellent pass catchers, a la Tyreek and Kelsey? Go Chiefs. Uh, sincerely, the sweet uh, Daniel Miller. What do you think about that, John? Do, are we in for a offensive overhaul this offseason? Uh, yeah, absolutely. At least at wide receiver. Um, I mean, I don't know how you can not go there. Uh, and maybe a wide receiver and a tight end, uh, depending on what happens with Kelsey. I would have thought that Kelsey would play another couple of seasons. But, uh, you know, as time goes on, I'm getting more and more convinced that uh, he's thinking a lot about walking away from the game. I know there's no, like, numbers in in quantifying this, but he looks a little grumpier. And Mm -hmm. uh, he also... I I don't know if... He always used to get a lot of attention. So I think, you know, we could say that that he's getting a lot of attention this year and it's affecting his numbers, but I don't know there. It just seemed like in general, I'm not doing a deep dive. It's not like I put all these clips together and I'm, I'm just telling you how I feel. I'm sure people feel similarly. It just seems like he's just a step tick or or a step slower, which um, is surprising because it felt like it never was going to happen, but we'll see if he wants to play past this year. I especially wonder if he'll want to play another season, if they are able to, get through this uh, AFC gauntlet, get to a Super Bowl and and somehow win it. Um, You know, I I think 
if they were to win again this year, that would actually make me think that there's even a higher chance of him maybe right. calling it. So we'll see. I would agree with that. Yeah. On that. And I'm not sure. And it's, it's wrong for me to believe this. Okay. Yeah. But I think that Taylor Swift is making a difference. If he didn't have <laughs> the girlfriend waiting sure. at home, right. I'm not sure he'd be thinking about it very much. I think he'd be pushing harder to play longer, not pushing well, harder this. to play, but pushing harder to play longer. You know, this is to his credit, too. He's, he's done a really nice job uh, building businesses outside uh, the football field. I read somewhere that he has the most c commercials of any NFL player this year. We know about the SNL stuff. He's a pretty good actor, pretty amusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there, you know, the podcast stuff. There's other um, angles uh, of him to do stuff after football. I know that the fashion is another thing. So we'll see. Uh, and, and, you know, I think stemming from that article that came out in The Wall Street Journal, you know, this is a message too. You just, I don't know if we know when it's going to be. Uh, so what I would tell mm -hmm. you is enjoy, enjoy these games of, of Kelsey. Cause I, I think uh, it, I could easily see him um, playing again next year. You know, er, sure. everything that he has said before this is, has said he loves it and, and he you know, wouldn't want to uh, leave until his body pushed him out. But, you know, for the first time, I think there's uh, somewhat of a, a, an adjacent door for him to uh, call it a little bit earlier than, than we all thought. So we'll see as far as your, Bigger question goes, uh, you know, I maintain, kill me for it if you want, that the Chiefs have enough in the room to win a championship this year. But I do think that they load up. Yeah, I think they load up on offensive weapons. You, you know, you know, you, John, you mentioned a, a tight end could be in the mix. I see them at least getting a wide receiver in free agency and then going in the draft. Uh, the other day on 610, we do the questions at the end of the AP radio that I do with Dusty. And one of the questions was, what's your uh, perfect wide receiver room? Or, you know, what's a dream wide receiver room realistic? Uh, and I said that I and I think that Rasheed and, and Sky are going to be here. Sky is still going to be on his rookie deal. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that uh, I think MVS is gone. I did think Darius would be here. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I, and I still tend to think with the last year on his contract, he'll be in the room. But I like the Chiefs maybe to be interested. Again, dream scenario. Go get T. Higgins and then draft uh, Keon Coleman out of Florida State. That seems to be in the range where maybe the Chiefs could trade up, given that all of these um, quarterbacks are going to go. And, uh, you know, I think if you have that room, especially with, with Rice and his emergence, which I'm sure we're going to get to, you'll start feeling pretty good uh, about what the Chiefs have as far as weapons. And uh, a big part of that has been Isaiah Pacheco as well. You know, we'll I'll talk about that, but he should be back in the mix next week. Okay, let's get into this Andy Reid sound from Monday, John. And we mentioned what has been a, a tough year for Kadarius Tony. You know, if you, you go all the way back to the first day of training camp, uh, five minutes in, he comes off the field and he misses the entire training camp and has to have surgery, finds a way to be back week one, but it was a drop fest week one and it probably cost the Chiefs the game. And I think you could say in, in that game, uh, seemed like his snap counts were lower, increased the past couple of weeks. We know about the offsides penalty yesterday, an inexcusable uh, drop. It, I mean, it it's as bad of a drop as you ever have ever seen. I mean, it it was right in his hands the ball, and he somehow pops it up into the hands of the opposing team, and he he kind of opened the door for what could have been the Patriots getting some steam and, and managing to come back. Uh, we got Andy on Monday, and and I asked him about. Kadarius and his opportunities. Here's what he had to say. Yeah, Pete, I'm not going to get in all that. I mean, the, the obvious is that you know he's got to, he's got to make sure he catches the ball and does that. He's got he's got a tremendous amount of talent. So um, he's a good kid, uh, you know, good attitude, good kid. So, uh, but you you know you got to make, make those plays. He knows it uh, as well as anybody. So I'll leave it. Just leave it at that. You know. I think that's Andy Reid kind of saying he's going to adjust uh, his his snaps um, heading into this next game. I mean, he's never someone that's going to come out and and say, "Yeah, we're benching him." But that's as close to to him saying that I I think as we can get. If you look at the snap counts from this game, John, it was Rice, Watson, and Tony had twenty six, uh, followed by Valdez Gantling, Sky Moore, and uh, Richie James. But it it does seem like to me that uh, Tony will be decrease in this upcoming game yeah um that could be uh or it may be that uh they're just going to keep feeding it to him i mean i think it's clear to me at least 
And I think what Reed said kind of confirms that to me, that they think he's a talented guy. I mean, that's certainly what Travis Kelsey was saying on his podcast last week. Uh, you know, miss me with all those comments about Kadarius Tony, he was saying, because I think the guy is fantastic. And yeah, the talent is there. Uh, we've seen him not only be elusive this year, but also be tough going in and dragging people around and stuff. And I think that's what the Chiefs like about him. So I'm not entirely sure they're all in on reducing his usage. They might. I agree. They might. But, um, you know, who's going to take it? They've yeah. already got they've I, already got <laughs> Rice way up there. Yeah. Justin Justin Watson, they could give him more snaps, but he hasn't Tony has been more uh has caught more balls than Watson has. Um as as many as he's missed, as many drops as he's had and you know the interception obviously was bad. You're exactly right. That's as bad a one as you'll ever see. But um it's not like he's you know, been a complete failure as a, as a pass catcher. He just hasn't been. Yeah. I think the thing that sticks out to me about that answer though, is if the, the playtime wasn't going to be cut, I, I just feel like Andy would have just reaffirmed his confidence and said, instead of saying, you know, I'm not going to get into all that. Yeah, that could and, be. And you know, yeah. John, you, you're asking who could, could take some of those snaps, Richie James, who had two yesterday. Here were Andy's comments on Richie James. To see on on Ross, just uh, where that goes. I'll get with Veach today, and we'll go through all that. <clears throat> Richie, though, has got to play more than two snaps, so uh, that's my <clears throat> that's my responsibility on that. I didn't have him in on enough stuff, and he's a good football player, though. So again, going back into these snaps, I mean, I don't I don't know how drastic it's going to be. What and I I put out this analysis on on X. I think Rice and Watson are going to be your top two guys. I think that stays the same. I do think that Tony gets a decrease. I think Valdez Scantling probably stays somewhat of the same in that part-time role. Sky Moore actually is dealing with a knee issue. We're going to get more clarity, I think, about that on on Wednesday. And I think James goes up. Like I said, I, I don't know how drastic it is, but I, I think Tony will have a little bit less and, and Richie James will have a little bit more. James keeps getting these limited opportunities and somehow manages to get on the stat sheet where you have seen Sky Moore, for example, even before this injury issue, he, you know, 30, 40 snaps, can't find a, a way to get a catch in this game. So I just think naturally James needs some kind of opportunity. And here's the thing, what I will say, and we'll see if they do it, John, you know, to your point. But if if they are going to give James more offensive snaps and Tony is going to go down, you might as well make Tony the returner. Because to me, he's your most dangerous uh, option as a returner. And if you're going to keep him out of the offense, I, I think you you maybe make that switch. We've seen what Tony can mean for the team as a returner. But you know, not, now you're getting into the nitty gritty, the, the different uh, things that would play off, like the domino effect that is maybe changing up these offensive snaps in the rotation. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair point, but I but I agree that there's probably more to it than we realize. We're sitting out here going, "Oh, we'll just swap this guy for that guy and swap this guy for that guy." And and inside the building at Arrowhead, they're talking about how does that impact the packages? Right. You know, who's going to be the X, who's going to be the Y, who's going to be the Z and so on. Right. And uh, you know, it's not quite as simple as we'd like to make it uh outside of the of the coaches meeting room. Yeah. Here's the thing that you, you should know. Just uh, I know that we hear different things at the press conference. Um, and this is kind of a maddening thing when you really think about some of the answers we get sometimes. John is like they know who's going to play usually like when they start practice. The pre so they're having those conversations right now. So um, <laughs> sometimes we're getting on Wednesday. Yeah, I don't know if this guy's going to be. A they know, you know, Dave Tobe knows who his special teams folks are going to be so that they can prepare and get ready for the next game. So those conversations are happening now. Um, we'll, we'll see, you know, after the meetings and stuff on Tuesday and we'll see the rotation heading into this week. But I, I think a, a minor shakeup is in line. Uh, we'll of course keep you updated on that with our, our snap counts at Arrowhead pride. John does a great job with that stuff. Uh, a quote from Andy Reed on Isaiah Pacheco. This was a, a really positive uh, thing for the chiefs heading into this game. We had mentioned it earlier. Here was the status update on the Chiefs starting running back. Uh, it wasn't the muscle, um, but he'll, he'll be back. Um, 
this week. You know, he'll, mm-hmm. he'll be good to go this week. So unless there's further setback, but I mean, right now it's been everything's positive for him to go. And he really had uh, a clearance last week from the fellow that did the surgery to go. So it was just a matter of uh, being precautious on it. That's really good news that he could have yeah. played this week. Uh, so mm-hmm. he'll definitely be back. I mean, I, I know that they were still being cautious as to what they were saying, but it sounds like he'll definitely be back. And that is uh, just a huge boost. That was a worry for me because I, in our conversation with Kelsey and even now Rice has really emerged, um, the, you know, these past couple weeks, but uh, still even, I just think Isaiah Pacheco, if you're going to make this run uh, is the most important player to, to be in this mix. And so good. The chiefs will get him back. And, and I think even, with Clyde, like Clyde might have found himself some kind of role, uh, even beyond uh, Isaiah. Chiefs have a lot of good running backs in this room, especially with Pacheco back. So I think it's just a great thing headed into the playoffs. Yeah, this is uh, interesting to me because this is one of those cases where the Chiefs didn't give us a lot of information about what was going on with Pacheco. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, apparently sometime after it happened, they told us that he'd had this soldier's uh, shoulder surgery. Right. And um, the immediate reaction was, oh, my gosh, he's had this surgery. He's going to be out, you know, weeks upon weeks. Well, no, he had it a while ago. They just didn't tell us about it. It was kind of mm-hmm. I think it confused a lot of people about what his prospects were. Yeah, it kind of sounded like it kind of sounded like today he had it fairly shortly after the injury, which was two weeks ago. Right. Weeks ago, right. You know? Right. And apparently a minor surgery, not that big a deal. So. Um, and even last week, Reed said that he expected him to be back this week when he told us that he'd had the surgery. Well, you know, all the surgery talk, uh, and going back to the Kelsey thing, you found out in the wall street journal that Kelsey has just had 10 surgeries. We don't know. We don't have, we didn't have the information on all 10, yeah. 10 you know, it, you, it almost makes you wonder how often these players just, yeah, we're just going to go in for a scope and a cleanup. And it's like, this is the normal life of the NFL of yeah. all these corrective mm-hmm. surgeries that you have to have. But uh, Pacheco goes and gets it done. They called it a shoulder cleanup. Uh, I don't think they would be making him active if they didn't feel good about, uh, you know, his durability in in the rest of the season and the postseason and beyond. So really good to get him back in the mix. Uh, I'll say it again. I, I think he's a top five running back in the NFL. So you're always going to want that that player uh, available for you. Here was uh, Andy Reid. One final thing here on the Rasheed Rice touchdown play, the trick play that we saw that gave Rice the rookie record for touchdowns in a single season for uh, a chief. You know, uh, Todd, that thing I've been saying, I was going to call it the last few weeks and it just what, there wasn't the right opportunity to do that. Um, uh, but that was a good spot for it right there. And, and, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, because we were ready to run it at that time. That That's not what I'm saying. Uh, we, we've been ready for the last few weeks on it, but you know, you, you work on it once or twice a week and, and then you, you build enough weeks on it, then you feel pretty good about that to answer your question on whatever play, you know, it is. So, yeah, it's kind of different. That one was obviously a little different. That was from, uh, I believe it was the Penn um, Columbia game in like the 40s. So, you know. The 40s. <laughs> the 40s. This predates you, John. We've got to play yeah. that. <laughs> well, there I, thought a, there. I thought a really funny wrinkle uh, f- from this uh, play yesterday uh, was the fact that that Jarek McKinnon and Rasheed Rice knew that Rice needed another receiving touchdown to stand alone as the, the rookie with the most receiving touchdowns in Chiefs history. And when they ran this thing at practice, it was always a handoff. So on their own, Jarek decided he's just going to flip it, which becomes a passing <laughs> touchdown. For him. So I, w- I just want to bring up the fact that imagine if this play that he had a lane there was like bobbled, fell incomplete or even worse, like because they decided to to do this flip that was fumbled away or something. Anyway, uh, really cool, uh, nifty play. And definitely, John, one of those moments where it's great because it worked. But had that not worked or something oh, went yeah. wrong, oh, yeah. this would have been a, a big talking point. <laughs> Chiefs fans for sure. Yeah, it would have been. But uh when they work, everybody loves them. It's just when they don't, then then Andy Reid is what is the expression? Too cute. Yeah. Too cute, cutesy. Yeah. Yeah. I uh I like the play. Uh and Peter King had more on it in his column. Uh I 
I went to the Peter King column because I saw it pop up on my ex account this morning. And uh, I, I didn't I read that part, but I need to go back and read the whole thing. But I did see in the comments responding that Peter King made no mention of James Cook, who had like a thousand yards yesterday. And he made no mention of the San Francisco 49ers, who probably can fairly claim that they're the best team in the NFL. So um, the gripes happen at the national level, John. So we, we should feel good about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, it's good to know. Yeah, that's it for Andy Reid. If you want to hear the uh, Andy Reid press conference in its entirety, you can right here on the Arrowhead Pride Podcast Network. We have it on From the Podium. When we come back, it's time for those world-famous marinated takeaways. Stay with us. Back here on the Arrowhead Pride Editor Show, the Chiefs are coming off a 27-17 to 17 win uh, over those New England Patriots, uh, upset at at the the turnover because I had twenty seven thirteen in my Arrowhead Pride prediction for this game, and they they really messed that up. I, I think I was heading for it, and and we didn't get it. So that's my first mini marinated takeaway. Uh, John, uh, you watched <laughs> this game. Uh, I'm sure you have your thoughts on it. So uh, as we usually do, we'll start with your first takeaway here. What did you think? Well, I think this was a, a much better win than it's being given credit for. Um, I think it was a mistake to think that the Patriots are a three and 10 team and the chiefs are just going to go in there and wallop them. The Patriots have been playing excellent defense for the last month or so. And uh, I was going to be surprised if the, if the chiefs scored more than, you know, 24 points uh, my prediction was for a 2010 win. And it turned out to be 27-17. So they actually scored uh, significantly more points than I expected that they would. And um, the defense did a good job against a quarterback that I thought played very well. I was pretty impressed with that guy. I I know that unless a player uh, has become a sort of star, it's easy to put these guys down. Uh, People were, for example, putting Jordan Love down when the Chiefs played the Packers, but he played a great game and has been playing well this year, just like Aaron Rodgers did in his first year as a starter. And here we see uh, this young man who was a fourth-round pick, I guess, and he, I thought, played really well against the Chiefs. Just the Chiefs have a good defense, and holding that team with that quarterback to 17 points, I thought was a, was a good job. I really, I really thought this was a more impressive win than people have been given it credit, given credit for. Yeah. You face a three win team. And I think Andy Reid was alluding that to that in his opening statement today, where, you know, they had a, a bunch of games where they were within one score. Mm-hmm. And I think especially the defensive side is pretty good for new England. So, um, to be able to put up 27 you know you're nearing the 30 mark 30 is is acceptable i think any week like if you get to 30 in the range of 30 you should feel pretty good about the win so i i would tend to agree with you and i also think like the defense faced some adversity a little early and they were able to to kind of settle in and and give give the chiefs an opportunity there uh, I, um, I'm with you. I like the win. Uh, and it's, a, it's a good win to, to build off of as you head into this final stretch where you need to win every game, uh, if you're going to have a chance, cause Baltimore was able to beat Jacksonville and they're two games up right now. And so you got to keep the wins coming. My first marinated takeaway is my God, uh, Rishi Rice. This is wild. Uh, we thought, you know, he was this player, um, At the beginning of the year, I think there were signs that he could be a good option for the Chiefs, and he had developed into that. But now he's entering a stretch where he's been one of the better wide receivers in the NFL, period. McMullen, uh, Matt McMullen, friend of of the show in the site, had this uh, since week 12. He has 32 catches. That's second among all players. 334 receiving yards, fourth among all players. Uh, and three touchdown catches. That's fifth among all players. That's in the league. That's that's in the the NFL. Cody Tapp, uh, another friend of the the show in sight, had this. Uh, in the last four games, he's averaging nine and a half catches for eighty three and a half yards and a touchdown. Uh, and then you project that over a seventeen game schedule, that would be one hundred sixty one catches for a thousand four hundred and nineteen yards uh, and and seventeen touchdowns. Those. That's crazy. I mean, those are crazy numbers. And uh, so, you know, you think about the the second round pick and, and the Chiefs went back to back years where they took a, a wide receiver in the second round. I've, I've talked about it for countless times as to 
why they didn't end up with a first round receiver this year. Not, not because they weren't trying more about where they were picking in the NFL draft. And that's because they were the damn Super Bowl champions, but you, <laughs> you blink here. And I think you're looking around the league at these rookies, um, Puka Nakua in LA and um, Ravens wide receiver, uh, safe flowers uh, comes to mind. Maybe Vikings uh, wide receiver, Jordan Addison, but Rasheed is kind of playing himself into that conversation of um, especially this stretch and, and what he can do of, of maybe being the best of that bunch, but at least like it's a conversation now, which you know, in the middle of the year, the names that I just mentioned, uh, Nakua flowers uh, and Addison, I didn't think there was a chance that you would put rice in that mix. Whereas I, I think he's worked himself into that conversation, which is a, a really nice job um, by the personnel staff because everyone kicks themselves for, for, for missing on, on Puka, but they and, and Addison were kind of advertised as these type yes, of guys. So good for the were, Chiefs yeah. to get good for the chiefs to get rice in the second round. And, and who knows what he's going to do these last three games in the playoffs. He has a sneaky 1000 potentially um, here. Uh, what is, I, I think he's in the near 800 right now. So you got, yeah, games. well, that was, that was actually, uh, my marin second marinated oh, takeaway was yeah, about, you can talk about it. Go ahead. Rish, yeah. Rishi rice and, and the impact that he's made the unexpected impact, you know, we have to compare. Yes. He's he's, we have to compare him to the rest of the league, of course, because those are the, the current guys, but for the chiefs, I think the comparison is to Dwayne bow. Now consider this Dwayne bow started 15 games in his um his first season with the Chiefs and gained 995 yards, 70 receptions. Well, Rice is clearly going to beat that number of receptions and he's he might actually beat the 995 yards. When I first started paying attention to this about a month ago, um Rice was on pace to get I think 814 yards. He's now on pace to get 915 yards. And this is a wide receiver who early in the season was getting like, you know, 20, 30 yards in a few of the games. And um, so he's really made a big step forward here as the season has gone on. And um, he could easily be a guy who gets a thousand yards. He'd be the first chiefs receiver to get a thousand yards in his rookie season. And, um, I, you know, what's not to like about this guy? He's just done a fantastic job. The nine receptions on nine targets when <laughs> the rest of the wide receiving room seems to be having trouble, uh, you know, bringing in these catches, I think should tell you pretty much all you need to know. You're also allowed to fumble it if you pick up your own fumble. I don't know how he got that ball right. back, but <laughs> thank God he did. Or that kind of. That that was a point that could have really ruined a great day for him, but sure you know, could have, and he and he did bring it back. That's exactly right. Um, so yeah, like Rice, this goes into my second marinated takeaway, and I'm you know it's stemming from that. And look, I'm not, this is going to be a little bit of a mini rant, but so fast forward about a minute, minute <laughs> well, thirty. That's what we you, need is more if you want to annoy. Yeah, if you yeah. if you get annoyed by my mini rants, I, I feel like a minute thirty should get you past it. <laughs> but stemming from that, are we okay to say that? Patrick Mahomes has enough weapons to win a championship this year because you have Isaiah Pacheco coming back here who has been explosive and one of the one of the better running backs in the league. I talked about that. Still have Travis Kelsey. We mentioned that it, it seems a little bit different this year, but I think he still has an impact not only when he is able to touch the football, but also as a decoy. You can see that other teams are paying attention and it's opening the door for other receivers uh, and a Clyde edwards helaire in that spot. Sorry. Uh, and now you have Rasheed Rice, who I think we're seeing here is a top receiver, not only in the AFC, not only in the AFC West, in the in the NFL. So you have a top receiver. You have Travis Kelsey. You have Isaiah Pacheco. So you have three viable weapons right there. It, it is annoying. I'll admit this. In week 16, they're, they're still trying to identify who that next receiver, that next, next pass catcher is going to be. But you feel like you have three good weapons. That's pretty good in the NFL. And now you can see where Clyde can have an impact. You're seeing where Jarek McKinnon can have an mm -hmm. impact in yeah. these 12 sets. You're seeing how Noah Gray can have an impact. They have enough. I mean, I, we're, we're at a point, and I, I know I got killed for this all year, but with the emergence of Rice, once you play 15, 16 games, 17 games in the NFL, and the, the Chiefs coaches will always say this, it's like you're basically a second-year player for the playoffs. So they have that now going in, and and I, I think, look, uh, 
I, I I've, I've mentioned it a lot of point, times before, you know, and I'll, and I'll say it again here. Like, I don't know if it's fair to go all in on this criticism of Brett Feach and the staff, because this wide receiver room is, is a lot like it was last year. You exchange rice who we just raved about for mm -hmm. Juju. The rest of the guys who won a championship are the same. And like, when you criticize Veach, you're, you're kind of asking him like, yeah, you should have predicted the extreme regression for three 20 somethings, Marquez Valdez, Scantling, Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony. Like, I don't know if that's actually like a fair criticism. Now, if you want to say they should have did something in free agency, talked about how the Ravens have ruined that. If you want to say they should have did something in the trade deadline, well then maybe you wouldn't have some of these defensive pieces that have led you to this position. Like, I don't know if Drew Tranquil is here, if they go and get a wide receiver, um, so I don't know. I, I just I think I think it's going to be tougher than previous seasons. But I think mm -hmm. they've, again, yeah. put this team in a position where they can win a championship. Um, and so rant over. I, that might have been a little bit longer than a minute 30. So I apologize. <laughs> well, I'll just say this. I, I really wasn't going to say anything about this today. But now you've put me in a position like I, I need to, to bring this up. If you're looking at something and. It's like a guy that's been divorced six times. At what right. point does he realize he's the problem? Right. Okay. And it's kind of the same thing with the wide receivers. If the wide receivers are all bad, you know, if, if, if they've all, re you know, we've got three guys that people are saying have regressed beyond what would should be acceptable. And Brett Beach should have noticed it. Maybe the problem isn't the wide receivers. Maybe there's something going on with Patrick Mahomes. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to have any criticism of Mahomes, and I'm not making a criticism of Mahomes. I'm just saying that there might be something that's gone differently for him this year that has somehow impacted what, how easily it is to catch his passes. I'll say again, I've, I've said this to other people, that if you're a highly accurate passer, which Mahomes is, I think he's third or fourth on the league in completion percentage right now, that's going to tend to increase the number of drops that you are going to get from your wideouts because, you know, you're getting the ball closer to them. It's going to be easier to get the ball to where they might be able to catch it. Now, it's also true that the Chiefs drops are up a lot this year compared to other years, years that Mahomes has been the quarterback. So what's different? Is Mahomes just slightly off with his throws? Is he, you know, is there something going on here that isn't necessarily about the wide receivers? That may be why we haven't seen the Chiefs move quickly on the receivers, why it's taken them so long to move away from Marquez Valdez Scantling as a guy that gets a whole lot of snaps, for example. Um, I, and, and maybe maybe that's not it at all. But I, I have to wonder if maybe Mahomes has been a bigger piece of this than we've realized. I think he'll find his way out of it if it has been. Mm -hmm. um, I have complete confidence that he'll figure it out next year. If it was something, a problem some, of some kind this year, he'll figure it out. Um, but I just have to wonder it's getting to be beyond coincidence that you could have three guys who suddenly or everybody wants to cut. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's fair to bring up and it's tough because Patrick Mahomes has kind of earned the right uh, mm -hmm. to avoid criticism yeah. and bad stretches of, you know, by his standards, maybe not being as good as he, he has been in previous seasons. Now that, that being said, I think what you see in the reaction of fans is like, well, Mahomes is completely free of criticism all the time. We got to criticize somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And so you do see some of that. I don't know. I, I do think that there have been times, especially earlier in the season, uh, the things that's the, the moments that stick out to me is when he was almost trying these like floaty passes that were just like, why are you throwing that into the hands of like, there were, there were definitely moments like that, that we hadn't really seen in previous years. I think he's kind of settled back in and I think he's starting to get more trust with these guys. He certainly has come, really far with Rashi and it yeah. has changed mm -hmm. the entire feel of the offense and the team. And so you know, maybe some of that, but I, I think it's a decent point. I, I would love to get to the end of the season and, you know, we get to the, that off season. I mean, we really say um, to him, like, you know, what, what did you think of the season? What do you need to work on? I, I wonder if the answer maybe is a little bit differently than it has been in 
in previous years. Uh, all right, John, any other marinated takeaways from this Chiefs Patriots game? Well, no, I, I came up with one there just kind of in response yeah. to what you were saying. So, no, I think okay. that makes me done. Yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, the Chiefs defense had a nice game. Um, I, I think the slow starts has been a little bit worrisome, but I think they were more worrisome when it didn't seem like the offense was starting to hit its stride a little bit. Um, I know I keep saying that. I'm sure there are people rolling their eyes. I, I like to sometimes <laughs> take away certain plays, and I think the game is a dominating game if Blake Bell actually comes to the ball and, and if Kadarius doesn't have the worst drop of all time, right? Um, you take away those plays, it's it's a it's a it's a blowout, you know. I, so I I feel good about the offense. Uh, the defense did settle in again. I, I think what it was a little troubling to me, and I just think it's a point to watch, was the defending the tight end. Uh, Hunter Henry at the beginning of that game um, looked like Travis Kelsey, and it, it seemed like they were trying to keep the Chiefs defense in their base and really attack the linebackers. I looked up the grades. Uh, Nick Bolton and Drew Tranquil didn't fare well as far as coverage grades, neither did uh, Mike Edwards. And I just look at the AFC, and I'm like, okay, well, who has a tight end that can replicate some of that stuff? The Ravens have likely, you saw what he was able to do on Sunday night. Andrews could be back for the playoffs. Uh, the Bills ha have two, uh, Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox. The Jaguars have Evan Ingram. The Cleveland Browns have David Njoku. And I just, I think it's a point of emphasis that it needs to be for Steve Spagnuolo and the defense the rest of the way of making sure that that doesn't become a, a problem. We saw them actually do a nice job defending the run game, which was a, a step in the right direction because that had been a point sure, of weakness. Yeah. I was actually surprised at the way the Patriots attacked the Chiefs um, and, and, and in doing that and passing a lot because you would have thought that from a previous week that they just would have grounded and pounded with uh, Zeke Elliott, but it, it, but it didn't... Um, it didn't end up that way. It just what, and so early in the game, it was a little bit worrisome. You wonder how much Brian Cook has missed. It is, I think there is some slight optimism that he could somehow be ready to play in the postseason. But I think he's important. And I think kind of figuring out like how we can be better in coverage against tight ends because the, the, you know I don't know if you would call every tight end that I just mentioned elite, um, but those are tight ends that can do some damage if that's a point of weakness. And so. Something to watch. The Dolphins tight end Smythe. He doesn't scare me as much as these other guys. Like the, <laughs> the, Dol the Dolphins actually, because the Chiefs are good against opposing wideouts. The Dolphins actually project as a better matchup than some of these other teams that are a little bit tougher ground game tight ends, you know, that type of deal. So um, a point to watch for the defense. And I, I also wonder uh, how the Raiders, you know, maybe replicate some of that stuff on Christmas Day. Well, I'll I'll agree with you on on all of that. And I'll point out, too, that we have tended to discount the influence of Bill Belichick uh, because the Patriots have a bad record <laughs> this year. Right. And so everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, obviously it was Tom Brady that made the difference. Well, no, uh -uh. uh, Tom Brady wouldn't have been what he was without Belichick. And he's still a dangerous opponent. And I think uh, he deliberately uh, came into this game throwing when everybody thought he would run for a couple of reasons. One is, he knows that he's got a good quarterback there and uh, maybe not everybody else knows that yet, but he does and he needs to be sure. So that's another reason to put him out there in a, in a hopeless season. They're already out of the playoffs. So put him out there and see what he, what he's got, put him up against a good team and, and see what he can do. And I would have to think that they'd be encouraged what they saw from him yesterday uh, you know, when he was going to a receiver like Henry early in the game. So, yeah. um, so, you know, I think part of this is just recognizing that Bill Belichick is a really good coach well, and you have to allow for that. Look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I like Bill Belichick. I'm like not such right. a fan of how he handles the media. <laughs> I would be miserable covering Bill Belichick. And yeah. I really would be. Um, but I think he gets a, a bad shake when it comes to this Brady Belichick thing, because Brady left new England and he had, an opportunity to pick one of 31 teams and he made a really good decision um you know a, a coach that he could work with uh that was going to be tough on him you know as tough as he he wanted and a really good defense a team with a good offensive line and uh really good offensive weapons and he convinced the patriots to allow um gronk out of his thing there and had his best weapon and and like bill you can't just get a new quarterback like that. Like he, he, you know, and granted Mac Jones wasn't it, but like they weren't in necessarily a position to, to be 
top five and, and you pick your quarterback. And, and as we've seen in Kansas City, sometimes you just the, a, a quarterback isn't just going to come your way magically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think for me, what will be like a greater definition of how much did Bill have to do with this whole dynasty is next year because Bill Belichick gets to pick his quarterback next year. If you're believing everything that that comes out of uh, New England right now, um, usually there are about eight jobs. Uh, and so I'm sure that there are going to be owners that are really attracted to, to Bill Belichick. And he gets to say, all right, of these eight opportunities, here's who I think is the best situation. And that season will, to me, be more of a an indication of was it Bill or Tom or you know how much do they have to do it. And look, the, it's bringing it all back to the Chiefs. I think it may be in the AFC West because if I'm Bill, I would say to myself, I really like this Herbert kid. And uh, and what I would say is uh, I'll you know take care of this defense. I'm going to bring in a great offensive mind that can make the most of him. And you'll see now that I'm able to actually pick my quarterback, you'll see what I can I can do. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not a big Bill Belichick guy, but I, I don't think he gets a fair shake in, in this whole argument. Well, that's fair, and I would even add to this, add this to your to your thought. So he could stay there and pick his quarterback. Yeah, you know the, the Patriots every, are gonna are gonna have a, an excellent chance to bring in a top quarterback every, from the draft. So everything, I just I don't know. I don't know how long he wants to go. He's within a, a stone's throw of the top wins, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I think that. You know, everything that it is pointing to is is this is a mutual parting at the end, but I don't think Bill is done by any stretch of the imagination. So we'll see where he ends up going. It is a very intriguing part of New England. Um, it'll be weird to see Bill in a new place. It'll be weird to see a different head coach uh, if this all does take place. But um, good point by you. I, I think a- acknowledging that, hey, the, the Chiefs second level, we can attack that in, in the past game was a probably a, a Bill influenced uh, note there. All right, when we come back, we will have the snap count takeaways and the opening odds against the Las Vegas Raiders. Stay with us. Back here on the Arrowhead Pride Editor's Show, we have beaten the wide receiver snap counts to a pulp, John, but (laughs) uh, I know you. I know you like to dig into this. Uh, What else jumped out from this game? Well, you're right. We did talk about it quite a bit, but as usual, you gave raw numbers, and I like the percentages. Rasheed yeah. Rice, 92% of yeah, the snaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's number one wide receiver uh, snaps there. So maybe he isn't the guy that's putting up the production of some of these other guys, although the projections that you quoted before, that if he'd played the whole season like he has in recent weeks, it'd be, you know, yeah. he'd be up there. Um, so, yeah. I think the Chiefs have found themselves a number one wide out. There's not much question about that. Watson next at 69% and Kadarius Tony at 40% about what he was uh, the week before. Um, I'm like you, I, I'm not as convinced as you are that Chiefs will change that, but they might. And uh, and it might be Richie James that uh, be the person that gets uh, some of that work. Uh, shifting to the running back um, in the week before against the Bills, the Chiefs kind of split the running back snaps between Edward Zillaire and McKinnon. In this game, it was more like 60-40, 61% for Edward Zillaire, 36% for McKinnon. Uh, and they had a, a couple really, of plays. Yeah, they had a couple really of quick, plays. Uh, really quick note on that. Um, and again, this is just my Pete feel of the fan base. I think yeah, you might uh-huh. have seen a change of the guard in enemy number one. I, I really think Sky uh, <laughs> might have taken Edwards as Lair's place yesterday. Uh, fortunate for Sky Moore, who's only in his second year here. But uh, Edwards Lair won a lot of people back, I thought, with that, uh, especially that catch where he looked like yeah. a five foot five wide out um, mossing some other uh, you know defender there. Well, and this is this is why the Chiefs supposedly wanted him, is that he could be Brian yeah. Westbrook, you know, and be a guy that could catch a lot of balls out well, of the backfield. The good thing and... is it only took 900 days to figure out how to, <laughs> how to do that. Right. Or more than that, 1,200. Yeah, 1,200. Another thing that I thought was interesting in the snap counts from uh, Sunday's game was Travis Kelsey, uh, 75% of the snaps. Now, it's easy to say, oh, my gosh, it was, you know, 90 percent last week and you were raving about how he was getting all this work. Well, yeah, that's true. But that is the low side of his normal range. It's not uh, uh, that unusual for him to have 75 percent of the snaps in this game. However, what was different is that uh, Gray got, 
you know, obviously the rest of the tight ends, uh, tight end snaps, uh, Blake Bell had very few in this game, but Gray had more than 80% of the snaps on running plays. So what happened in this game was the Chiefs said, okay, we're not going to wear Travis Kelsey out. We're just going to put him out there on the passing plays and let Noah Gray take up the slack on the running plays. So that's what happened there. Um, on defense, uh, Drew Tranquil uh, still getting some mic snaps. Bolton had 80% of the defensive snaps. Tranquil had 39%, which means that he was in there for Bolton sometimes and sometimes is playing alongside Bolton. And Willie Gay was back to his normal level, which is around 50 or 60% of the snaps, 55% yesterday. And finally, Mike Pinnell, uh, 20% of the snaps. He essentially replaced Matt Dickerson, who was inactive for this game. And that brings up the question. They could elevate him from the practice squad for another couple of games and activate him for the the final game of the season and play him in the postseason. You suppose Mike Pinnell is going to be back as the, as the rotational guy on the defensive line. Well, I like the, uh, I like the performance of the Chiefs' defense against the run yesterday. I yeah. really did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you mentioned the top team in the conference. It's right now it's Baltimore and, and they're ground and pound. They get Baltimore got hit with a bad injury because uh, they had this Keaton Mitchell kid that was, Really, really good early down back. Um, and that that's more significant than I, I think people are going to realize, especially nationally. But um, they do like to to run with the quarterback. Uh, I think Gus Edwards is going to become that guy for them. And the Chiefs need to be ready to stop the run. That has been a weak point. Um, now we'll see how they adjust because I'm sure that they're, the attack of the second level is going to continue here as we've seen these past couple weeks, especially last game. Um, but, yeah, I, I like Mike Pinnell. And it it's not a – it's – it's an indication, right? More than just a random thing that Dickerson was inactive and Pinnell um, was up and, and activated um, donning the new 69 jersey. I think he was 64 um, the last time around. So that team. sounds right. Yeah, I think so. that's right. Yeah. Uh, OK, so are we done with snap counts. Anything else? Yeah, that's uh, that's all I noticed. Yeah. All right. So we are now uh, one week exactly away from Raider week, Christmas edition where the Chiefs and Raiders, in a very odd time slot, like back to COVID days, uh, will play at noon on a Monday, um, <laughs> which we all love. We love working on Christmas here at AP. And, uh, and John, you have the opening odds. So uh, what do we have there? Uh, the Chiefs are favored by 10 points in this game. Um, at least they were when, uh, at the, when the time that both the, the odds came out last night. It was a 10-point 10, a 10 favorite for the Chiefs. I haven't looked today. I mean, the Raiders are coming off a 63 point performance. Yeah. Well, you know, there's no such confidence heading into it. Right. But that's not how this stuff works though. You know, everybody after the, the Broncos were gave up 70 points to the, to the, to dolphins, everybody was like, well, they gave up all those points. Then, you know, obviously every other team is going to score that many points on them. Well, no, that didn't happen. It's not how this works. And sometimes in a game, things would just get out of hand. And that's what happened in that game with the Dolphins. And that's what happened in that game with the Raiders. They're mm-hmm. still not very good team. And the Chiefs have an excellent chance to, to beat them at home on Christmas Day. Uh, I saw, John, that you, just before we go, because we got a little extra time here, I saw you put up our playoff picture. Uh, so mm-hmm. I want to touch on that before we get we, we get going here, just because we are three games away and uh, the chiefs have plenty of, of room here to improve their standing. But, you know, also if they were to slip up, uh, it could be a slippery slope because of just how close everybody is. Yeah. This is a very interesting situation to me. Uh, I didn't really touch on this in the article that I put up at arrowheadpride.com, but um, the chiefs are either going to get the first seed or they're going to get the second seed. Uh, that's the most likely possibility that that uh, that things will play their way in this coming weekend. And if they don't, the odds are very good that the Chiefs will get the second seed, which means that they could still end up hosting the AFC championship if they do well in the in the playoffs. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that if they <laughs> if they make the playoffs, they're almost certainly going to win the AFC West division. There are so many teams 
that are close to 500, there's no room for the Chiefs to make the playoffs as a wild card. Right. <laughs> they're very, when they, they win one game this weekend uh, against the, the Raiders, they'll win the AFC West and they will get into the playoffs. And there's really no two ways about it. If they get into the, the playoffs, it's going to be because they won the AFC West and they're almost certainly going to win. They can, they all have to do is win either the games against the Raiders or the chargers in week 18 to get in. Or uh, if the Broncos lose one, which seems pretty likely the chiefs could get in by winning any of the three games that are remaining. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I, I still think this, I, I watched the Ravens game last night. I, I think the Ravens are, there's not going to lose two games the rest of the way. So I, I think the chiefs will end up being the two seed here. I wonder about the three seed. Um, you know, I, I think for a long time, we just assumed that it would be the Miami dolphins, but the Miami dolphins have some tough games remaining. I just mentioned they play the Baltimore Ravens, but they also face the Cowboys and the bills that that could have Owen three written all over it. And let's say they were to drop the next two. Cause you know, the Cowboys, they got embarrassed. So they're going to be right. Mm-hmm. Refocus this week. Um, if they lose the next two, they're going to be in danger of losing the uh, AFC East to those Buffalo bills, which I actually think would be ideal for Kansas city. Um, I don't think you want to see it, the bills in any of the wild cards. I don't think they're a team that you want to play right now. You'd rather maybe there's a scenario where, where Baltimore and, and Buffalo could beat up on each other. Really uh, interesting scenario because I think there are some spicy teams um, in the playoffs this year. You know, when you think about the uh, Cincinnati Bengals and and the Cleveland Browns with their defense, um, I think if CJ Stroud could, you know, get back to the Texans, they, you know, and, and they can get in uh, the uh, AFC South is still wide open and, and up for grabs. So we'll ends up see, seeing um, what happens like that. And then you look at the NFC Eagles have been kind of reeling the seventh seed right now is the LA Rams who are, are turning it on. And I, I think we've seen in these past couple of years, where the two seed would be matched up with the seven seed, which was a new thing, you know, a couple of years back. And it just was always just a convincing win. And you never really saw a, a chance for an upset. Whereas uh, I think the two seven is going to be rather interesting in both conferences this year. Uh, and the chiefs might be a part of that. I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, as I said, I think they're going to get the two seed. I'm very curious to see who that matchup is going to be. Well, you know, everybody is upset about the possibility of the chiefs playing the bills in the postseason. I've seen a lot of people say, Oh, we don't want to face the Bills. Oh, no, because, you know, they beat us. Well, to me, that's the perfect setup. Mm. The Bills have been winning these games in the regular season and then losing the games against the Chiefs in the playoffs. I think if the Chiefs had won that game against the Bills, that's when I would be scared about playing them in the postseason because they would be then, you know, uh, loaded for bear to come in and play the Chiefs. But if they if they've won a game against the Chiefs in the regular season, I think that gives the advantage to the Chiefs, especially if they're playing at home. So I wouldn't worry too much about playing the Bills if it's me. Yeah, I mean, I just think of all the teams in the AFC to face on Wild Card Weekend. I just I think for me, maybe I'm sorry to join the fans, but I just I think for me it's the Bills. I mean, they just look like they um, are finally turning it on at the right time. It, yeah. That, you know what? You know what's tough here, and I, I mentioned it after the game. I I think the Chiefs had a chance to bury the Bills, and they they mm-hmm. left the light on. Uh, and rather than, and I I also think like going into that game, you wonder what these alternate scenarios in the NFL are always like because uh, McDermott was going through that nine eleven thing, and you know the Chiefs looked. What, what if they were to win that game? You know, is and and all of a sudden they you know they don't have their playoff hopes it does let yet yesterday play out the way way it did um if it if it kind of spirals from there is McDermott even a part of the bills now if the bills go on this magical run and somehow do it right they then all of a sudden it it reestablishes it's just you always wonder about these alternate scenarios the butter the butterfly effect of the NFL John um, yeah that we see well sometimes. but see see the way I would look at that is you started off by saying that the Chiefs uh, were in a position to bury the bills and didn't. Mm. So why couldn't we believe that they could do it in the, in the postseason yeah. as well? So well, that's, you that's know. the, that's the clear burial uh, time to do it. Right. Right. All right. Exactly. Uh, 
<laughs> this this was a nice, uh, neat, great show. Uh, we we covered a lot here. Uh, keep it locked in at arrowheadpride.com and, of course, the Arrowhead Pride Podcast Network as we get ready for this Christmas game for the Kansas City Chiefs and the Las Vegas Raiders at noon uh, on Monday. As we said, Christmas Day. I'll be out there. Uh, if you want to get a last minute Christmas gift, I wrote a book about last year's season. It's called The Dynasty Begins. You can find that at Triumph Books. I think it's still at some places in Kansas City Fanatics and and whatnot. So, um, you know, I, I would take a look at that if you if you want a last minute gift. Uh, thank you to Steve behind the the virtual uh, glass. If you leave us a review, we will read it right here on the Arrowhead Pride Editor Show. For John Dixon, I'm Pete Sweeney. Thank you for joining us on another edition of the AP Editor's Show. <laughs>